Hi, I'm Christy McDonald, and here's what's coming up on One Detroit Arts and Culture. Artists get to showcase their work in time for the holiday season in Mount Clemens. Phil Gilchrist from the Anton Arts Center explains. Plus, behind the scenes of the Detroit Public Theater televised production from Broadway to obscurity and bringing local theater to your living room during COVID. And a program helping students explore different religions across our area. We'll take you on a virtual tour. It is all coming up on One Detroit Arts and Culture. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program provided by the Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The Kresge Foundation. Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Nissan Foundation. Ally. The Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation. And viewers like you. Hi there, and welcome to One Detroit Arts and Culture. I'm Christy McDonald. Thanks so much for joining me. I'm still social distancing at my house as cases of COVID are on the rise. It really makes us miss those in-person concerts, plays, and art fairs. The creative community is finding a way for artists and groups to survive during this time, and that's why we created One Detroit Arts and Culture, to keep you in touch with performances, music, and cultural events that we love to engage with and that really fill our soul. So coming up on the show, we have a behind-the-scenes look at what it took to bring the Detroit Public Theater production of From Broadway to Obscurity to Television. It's the beginning of a partnership and a way to get that theater fix that we're all craving during COVID. Plus, the Interfaith Leadership Council on helping people learn about different religions. It's the first in our series, and this week, we look at Sikhism. But we are starting off in Mount Clemens with the Anton Arts Center and their holiday market that's helping local artists showcase their work. One Detroit's Will Glover spoke with director Phil Gilchrist. Give us a little background on what the Anton Arts Center is and uh, what you guys do. So the Anton Art Center is a community-based art center located in downtown Mount Clemens. We often focus on exhibit programming. Um, we bring in artists from a local area, regional area, and showcase their work in a number of gallery spaces that we have here. Tell us a little bit about what the holiday market is. How long has this been going on? We feature artwork from dozens of area artists. Um, they're primarily from Southeast Michigan, many of them from Macomb County, um, a few of them from further flung locations, but not very many. And um, we bring their artwork in and we would usually turn our gallery spaces into sort of this um, really well-stocked holiday shop. Um, not specifically all holiday related items. There's a real wide range of arts um, and other sorts of craft items that that people could purchase from the market. Um, it's just a time of year when people often want to spend some money, right? Um, and making it very easy for the artists, making it very easy for the public, and then also being able to help the artists actually generate income. And so, um, as an example, last year's holiday market effort was able to help artists earn about $45,000, um, which wow. is a really significant um, amount of money that we were able to pay directly to the artists who made that work. Um, so beyond just having an opportunity for people to come and shop, this is also a really important opportunity for the community to be able to support artists. So is it going to be 100% online or is there going to be some in-person aspect to it? What we've settled on is a primarily online experience. Um, 
it was only this summer that we finally launched our art market online so that people could shop with us um, at their convenience rather than having to wait until we were open. Um, we do have an, an, a year round um, sort of uh, art market for artists to be able to sell their work on consignment with us. Um, the holiday market being sort of the big, the big time that that happens. Um, so we already have now established this online platform for sales that we're going to be capitalizing on for the holiday market. Um, we are working now on adding quite a bit of inventory for the holiday season. Um, but we have also decided to have very limited um, in-person shopping on some select Saturdays in late November and December. So um, we are finalizing the details for exactly what that's going to look like right now. And I'm hopeful that by the time this interview airs, we'll have published those details on our website. And for more on the holiday market, just head to our website at onedetroitpbs.org. We'll have the info there for you. Well, a few weeks ago here on Detroit Public TV, we had a night of local theater on television. It was the first effort of a partnership between us, the Detroit Public Theater, and the Mary Grove Conservancy to bring performances to our homes. Eric Gutman's one-man show called From Broadway to Obscurity was a total musical theater nerd's dream. It was a great show. It was funny, fantastic music. You felt like you were back at the theater. It took a lot of adjusting for both the theater and the television crews to bring the performance to air. And this is a look at how it happened. We did really great work yesterday. We are in really good shape. Thank you everyone for contributing everything that you have to get us to this point. And today's gonna to be really, really exciting. I mean, the um, pandemic's awful to this industry, to all my friends and coworkers and people that are far more talented than I who, who don't have work. There's uh, hand sanitizer and water um, at back of house and front of house. So um, please use those uh, and wash your hands frequently. I think we're all here to create art because we haven't been able to because of this pandemic. So we're here today and let's enjoy it. Oh, yes. Great. I feel so blessed and thankful to Detroit Public Theater and Chautauqua Institute and DPTV and everybody else involved that of all the shows that they picked mine. So the fact that I get to do mine, it just means, it means the world to me. That filming was the start of our partnership with Detroit Public Television, where we've been looking for ways to partner with uh, arts and cultural organizations such as DPTV to really showcase and highlight the benefits of our theater. Preserving our legacy of arts and culture in this community is a really important value of the Conservancy. We believe that through gentrification and through a number of other systemic changes in our neighborhoods, spaces such as these traditionally go away. And so we're working hard to make sure that these spaces remain affordable and accessible uh, so that arts and culture can remain a, a staple on this institution's campus. Shortly after graduation, I learned of an off-Broadway show that was having a Detroit run and they were looking for local understudies to audition. I figured I'd go, I'd have my first real professional audition experience. I'd Our mission at Detroit Public Theater is really to, to provide theater for everyone, to make theater accessible, to make theater that pe our public in Detroit, that people who live in Detroit, people who are Detroiters see themselves reflected in the work that we do. So I think the values of DPTV and Detroit Public Theater are aligned. We need more lighting because the camera can't, we can artificially yeah. give yeah, yeah, yeah. a little bit, but that's not going to look amazing. The theater community right now is in the somewhere around 95, 96% unemployment rate. So it's devastating out there. Another big motivation for us to, wanting to do this safely was to create work, but to try to find a way that we, and by example, all of us can continue to do what we do, what we were put on this that's earth right. to do. This is such a gift that we get to do this for eight hours. So. Soak it in. Don't know when we'll be in a theater again. <laughs> I teach college, you know, so I've been all summer long, we've been dealing with how do we make theater in our current situation. I leapt at the chance to do this when, when Eric called and said we were doing it. I love this show. I stage manage a lot of plays and I don't get the chance to do musicals a lot. So this is really a fun treat for me because it's so many mus musicals wrapped into one. 
one song. We're fortunate to be able to be doing this now, obviously. Honored to be able to bring it back. To be in a room with, with theater makers right now is, is phenomenal. Two thousand fourteen we premiered it, so it's been we've been performing it now for six years. In two thousand thirteen, a place called Berman Center for the Performing Arts in West Bloomfield, uh, the managing director there at the time uh, is an old friend of mine, and she called me. She said, "Do you want to do a cabaret about your time with Jersey Boys?" And uh, I was in Chicago at the time. I said, "Yeah, sure, that'd be fun." After ten months in Detroit, it kind of morphed out of a cabaret and into a book show. Started working on it with uh, Brian, uh, my director, and. Um, after 10 months and 14 drafts, we have what is being presented uh, tonight. Get me in for interviews at their restaurants. He knew he wanted to tell his story, but you know, initially it was kind of all showbiz. It was all that story. Uh, and I think eventually we found our way into the more personal narrative. And I think that's when we really found the heart of, of the show. Brian was really instrumental in kind of piecing all my thoughts together and so I don't kind of just go off the rails, so to speak, which sometimes I do. As we were developing it, you know, starting to learn you know, I had no idea about struggles and the things that, that he went through. So for me, it was like re-meeting a friend in, in that collaboration. And living in a city where there are 50,000 other actors just like you, struggling and clawing their way from audition to audition. With this show, we actually have only had a couple of days to put it all together. So it's kind of been a whirlwind right. process. I think all the shots are pretty wide, um, but not incorporating the projections ever. Is there a possible shot from this camera that has that also incorporates the projection? Uh, yeah. Okay. So and we had some partnerships, obviously, with um, DPTV and WNED that um, made it possible that we could uh, bring these these productions to life. You can start now, start centering them. For us, there's nothing that can quite compare to being in a room together with our audience, and we are craving that and looking forward to when that can happen again. But for now, we're not going to stop uh, making art and connecting. You're just too good to be true. What they're calling me is the transition director, which is actually, I've come to believe that it's, uh, I've, I'm the interpreter because I speak two languages. I speak theater and I speak film. My job is, is to watch what's happening on stage, but also watch hap what's happening on the monitor and make sure that the people on stage, what they're looking for is being translated to the people who are running the, the cameras and the uh, backstage. It's very strange to film in this way with no audience, you know? It's different. It's always different than being in a live theater. Not, there's no replacement for gathering in the room together with an audience. As I recall it ended. It's just, it's a ghost town. So it was hard to adjust that way. So to not have the human bodies there, the cameras, you know, he had, he did a great job communicating with those and, and playing the show as if there was an audience. I've done this show for, yes, yeah, six years. I've done it, I don't know, 60 times, 70 times. and. I always kind of know where the laugh is going to be or where the applause is going to be. 2,100 people think I am far too short to play this role. In Chicago... There's no holding for laughter, there's no holding for applause. So that's the big thing to kind of get used to. It's, it's knowing that I do like a really big song that takes a lot out of me and I don't have the, you know, six, seven seconds of applause to catch my breath. It's just like, catch your breath quick, move on to the next story. After 10 months in Detroit. There's a lot lost in that um, communion between the performer and the audience. There's a, it's a conversation. A performance isn't complete until the audience is there. The audience is part of the, the performance. The timing is just very different, and the energy. And I, I applaud Eric for being able to keep his energy up. I sing the hell out of my song. Jesus! Then he says, you know, Eric, I just don't think you're 
right for this role. The audience experience is becoming an isolated experience these days. More and more people have their, are witnessing it over their phone or their iPad or their, or their computer or their television. And don't get me wrong, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It is a tool and it's a magical tool. But at the same time, to have an experience with a group of people is something that I believe is in human DNA. I've been drowning out my cries. I pull myself together. And I'm focused on the prize. I'm falling, baby, through the sky, through the sky. I'm falling, baby, through the sky. We try and hone in the audience's eye on those particular moments, but we have to do it in a different way because it's a different medium, whereas the camera can just zoom in and capture that. So I'm having a, I'm having a fantastic time watching that happen. Could be in love with someone. With this project, we really wanted to keep it true to the spirit of a live, continuous production. It's almost as if you're watching a live show. It's definitely as close to that as we can get it for you. Theater and performing was a mere memory. And so there I was. It's funny how uh, life throws you a curveball sometimes. I was working at a desk job for a ticketing broker company in Southfield, Michigan. and. The call came in, and I took it, and it was, I mean, it changed my life, that one phone call. Hi, Eric. This is Jennifer from Dodger Theatricals. We would like to offer you a role in the first national tour of Jersey Boys. Talking to... People that have seen the show over the years is they say, gosh, you know, I, I was able to relate to this or to that, or, you know, I have a kid that wants to go into theater, or I did this 20 years ago and then I gave it up, you know, to raise a family and, and our, our lives are all kind of parallel that, that way. It's a great story and I think one of the things to take away from it is being somebody who's earlier in their career, it gives them hope to keep working and not stop going till you get that break. You know, we all get breaks, but sometimes it takes longer for other people, but work is the most important part of that, and Eric works very hard for it. It's been an amazing week doing this, and an amazing few months getting this ready, and I just hope that people will not just appreciate the shows, appreciate the work that's going into them. This is an experiment. We're really hoping that this uh, crosses that boundary and gives a lot of people who are missing the theater something that they haven't been able to go out to. Theater's not a part of everyone's life. Television is a part of everyone's life. So I think that television has a lot to offer us as theater artists. I think a lot of theaters are trying to adapt to this new way because they, they have to, they're forced to. And I only hope that all of these theaters that employ so many designers and, and artists will be able to do this and will have the opportunity like, like I did, like Detroit Public Theater did, like Chautauqua Institute did. For more on the Detroit Public Theater, what's next for them and our partnership, just head to our website at onedetroitpbs.org. All right, this next story is our first in a series that explores different faith communities here in Southeast Michigan, and we get to learn about them through the eyes of students. It's part of the Interfaith Leadership Council of Metro Detroit's program called Religious Diversity Journeys. And this week, we're taking a virtual tour and learning about Sikhism, a religion that preaches love, peace, and the equality of humankind. We're at the Sikh Gurdwara of Rochester Hills. This community is one of Religious Diversity Journey's faith community partners. My name is Wendy Miller Gamer. I am the director of Religious Diversity Journeys. With over 20 million members throughout the world, Sikhism is actually the world's fifth largest religion. Here in Michigan, the Sikh community continues to grow and thrive. 
There's about a dozen gurdwaras serving hundreds of families throughout the state. Today, Kennedy, a seventh grader at East Middle School, is going to get to explore the Sikh faith by asking questions of her peers, who she's going to meet soon, and some of the adults in the community. Hey, Kennedy, how are you today? We're so excited to have you here at the Sikh Gurdwara. Are you excited? Yeah. Before we start, um, we're going to just walk over, take our shoes off, and cover our heads. Sound good? All right, let's go over this way. For a Sikh, the key like goal of life is to make and understand this idea that the divine force is within everything and within ourselves, and to reconnect with that divine force. And to do that, a Sikh uses the Guru. And the Guru for us is a sacred text. Guru actually literally means brings light to darkness. And the sacred text contains teachings that describe how a Sikh should live their life and how one should make these connections to the divine. This idea of the divine force being within everything and there only being one, as well as using the Guru to help us connect with this one, these kind of make up the central tenets or beliefs of the Sikh way of life. Why do you think it's important for everyone, even non-Sikhs, to learn about these beliefs? So Sikhi is really based off of platform of um, good things like kind, being kind, being respectful, doing service, um, being compassionate. These are just things that basically anybody can learn, anybody can do, and we think that it would really help build a better society. The way we focus on things like love and compassion and respect and kindness and service, it just makes our whole world better. There are many reasons that Sikhs wear their turban. The main reasons are, number one, it shows, it, it shows respect to Waiguruji and it shows respect to other people. The second reason is that it shows a sense of royalty since we think the turban is a crown. And last but not least, the third reason is that our 10th Guru, Guru Gobind Singh Ji, he didn't want the six to hide in the shadows. He wanted us to be unique and stand out. For me, it's something that's very personal. I remember my history. I remember like those giants, that shoulders that I stand on, those that came before me that stood for certain values, and those values I'm reminded of every time I tie every single layer of my turban. Do you always wear a turban or do you take it off at home? I wear it all the time. Um, when I'm in the shower, when I'm sleeping, you know, everyone has their own style and flair. Thank you. Those are all the questions I had. Awesome. Thank you. So seva literally translates to selfless service. You do it because you genuinely believe in the importance of humanity and sharing with others. What are some seva activities you do with your family? So the awesome thing about seva is it can be done anywhere and anytime. So something that I do with my family and with the Gurdwara as well is we do the seva food truck, which we make home cooked meals and we deliver them to the homeless. Seva truly is being selfless and realizing that we're all in, in this together. Can you tell me a little bit about this space? So this is called our Gurdwara, which literally means um, the door to our Guru. Our Guru, the Guru Granth Sahib, is a central um, focus of any Gurdwara. We have it a little bit higher as a form of respect. And then we have the congregation sitting on both sides. What does it look like to pray? Um, so basically when we're praying, we always have our heads covered and we're always sitting cross-legged like this. We're all sitting together on the ground as equals. We don't think that you can only pray being in one certain place. There's no restrictions really. How does worship make you feel? Um, for me personally, it makes me feel kind of centered and it keeps my mind calm and at peace. Whenever I'm going through 
um, like a challenging time in my life when I'm worshiping, when I'm praying. I feel I do get a lot of guidance from the Guru Granth Sahib as well. Thank you guys so much for answering my questions. And I think this is a really special thing you do. So thank you. Thank you so much. I had so much fun and learned a lot of things. And you can learn more about the religious diversity journeys at OneDetroitPBS.org, and we will have more of them coming up in the next few months. Well, that is going to do it for us on One Detroit Arts and Culture. Have a great week. I'll see you back here next Monday. Take care and be well. You can find more at OneDetroitPBS.org or subscribe to our social media channels and sign up for our One Detroit newsletter. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program provided by the Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The Kresge Foundation. Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Nissan Foundation. Ally. The Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation. And viewers like you.